views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. It's been called the Island of the Dead, and it's only a mile off the coast of City Island. Since 1980, more than 62,000 people have been buried at Hart Island. These are so-called anonymous people buried in this modern-day potter's field. But advocates from the Hart Island Project say that it's time for the largest tax-funded cemetery in the world to become a park and provide public access. And that's our show tonight. We have footage and photos of a place in the Bronx that you have never been and probably have never seen. So stick around and we'll learn about the Bronx's Heart Island. No phone calls because we're on tape for the holiday, but you can send an email to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org or post comments on our Facebook page and we read those on the air during a future edition of our program. But for the here and now, we welcome to Bronx Talk the president of the Heart Island Project, Melinda Hunt. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And a uh, corresponding secretary of the City Island Civic Association, John Doyle. Welcome back Thank to you. the show. Appreciate it. Ms. Hunt, let's start with you. Why were you so fascinated with this island that has, I almost said nothing in it, but nothing alive in it, and uh, fascinated enough to the point that you created this project and are dedicating a lot of time and energy toward it? Well, I started out in 1991 re-photographing Jacob Reese's first photographs, which were taken on Hart Island, and I was really interested in it because it was a place, a part of New York that hadn't changed in a hundred years since Jacob Reese was there. And uh, so I worked with a photographer named Joel Sternfeld, and we published a book of photographs in 1998. And after that, people started contacting me for help in gaining access. And they wanted access because they may have been related to some of the people who are buried there. Most of the people that I work with know somebody who is buried there, and they would like to be able to pay respects. So let's just go through, before we bring uh, Mr. Doyle into the conversation, let's go through the process. So somebody dies maybe uh, in a hospital uh, or in uh, maybe an unfortunate accident. When the person is identified, they try to contact next of kin, but what happens? Well, what happens is that very soon after the death, if the family is present, they're asked if they want to make their own funeral arrangements or if they would like for the city to take care of it. And what's ambiguous is what is meant by the city taking care of it, which is always a burial on Hart Island. And, and do people, I, I, I mean, are they being defrauded in that way? Or is it just, well, we'll just give you enough information. And, and, the, and then all of a sudden people find out, oh my goodness, my, that burial, that happened and I had nothing to do with it. Or do people just say, well, okay, walk away and, and, and we understand you're going to take care of it and you walk away. Well, most people, if they were told this is a mass grave, you're not going to be able to visit and it's irreversible. If they were offered burial assistance, which the city does provide, um, they, most people would go to the trouble and apply for burial assistance, which does cover the cost of a simple burial or of a cremation. But that information is generally not provided by the hospitals. And it's not provided because the city council doesn't require that the hospitals hand out information uh, concerning alternatives to Heart Island. There, you know, just what you just said raises a number of different issues. I, I want to show people a video that's going to help really uh, illustrate what this is. I do want to bring you into the uh, dialogue, Mr. Doyle. So um, enter somebody who's involved in civics and involved in the city mm -hmm. and everything else. 
What, what is it that um, uh, Ms. Hunt's project wants right now? Sure. And, and why did you contact me and say, you know what, Gary, this is something we really want to sure. put uh, out? Well, Melinda's been working and her organization been working with all the council members, particularly council members Crowley, Elizabeth Crowley, and Councilman Vacca, who's our house council person, uh, trying to get support for intro, introductory bill uh, 133 and 134. Uh, there are two pieces of legislation. One transfers the jurisdiction from park from the Parks Department, or from the Department of Corrections, rather, to the Parks Department. The second piece of legislation would provide a ferry service on a regular basis, back and forth, so people can actually visit it. Otherwise, they'd be left to their own devices. Uh, it's obvious why, I think it's yeah. obvious why you would want to do that. Yeah. Are the, uh, is the other side because, well, of course, there's cost and, yeah. and, and that kind of thing. In other words, it's yeah. something else for the city to manage. Is that what the issue is? I think that Heart Island, because it's an island unto itself, has not really been discussed or really, this has been the first public dialogue I'm aware of on the, on the future of the island. Usually every 10 years, as we've discussed in the past, the city comes up with a horribly bad idea that City Island will always oppose, whether it's a, um, a trash power station, whether it's a... Uh, to put on that island. To put on that island. Whether they want to put an incinerator, whether they want to put a, uh, a larger Department of Corrections facility, which they actually did house people from DOC under short-term uh, short inmates in the 80s and early 90s, and then they also wanted to make it a homeless shelter back in the 80s as well. All things that, of course, people on City Island, you know, the antennas would go up on. What's ironic, I guess, for that is that yeah. if you were to do something like that, you would need a ferry service. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. How ironic, you yeah, know, yeah. you'd put a ferry service up for the use that you want, but yeah. maybe not for what some of the advocates want. Yeah. Uh, before we show the video, um, w what, what interest or is there interest from people at City Island, or is it just, well, that's nice, it's over there, well, and it's kind I, of curious. Yeah. No, Melinda's come to our group several times, and uh, she's brought people the with City Island, yeah, City Island Civic Association, okay. and also she's introduced us to individuals who have under you know either you know medication after they've had a stillborn baby or other sorts of uh, grievous situations have signed over their loved one over to the city and these stories break your heart and again if we can do something from where we are that can positively protect the neighborhood which is what this would do if we were to make it parkland it would protect the neighborhood it could be used for another purpose while at the same time providing comfort and dignity to a lot of people and their families why not do it it's kind of a win-win on both sides uh, does the create just real quick yeah. uh, just i thought of that uh, when you mentioned the creation yeah. of parkland isn't that a state legislation thing that has well, to happen it's, it's, it, will it be starts both. with the it city it starts council? with the city and then it'll okay. go to the state hopefully All right. so this was a piece that uh, uh, came out in australian tv i guess us and Australia, those are the ones really taking an interest in this. Another island. Uh, another island, that's right. A uh, much larger one. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Down so, under. That's right. So this was on a Dateline program in Australia. Okay, so we've yeah. taken a quick excerpt from it. Let's uh, roll the tape, and this will give you some pictures and some real idea of what we're talking about here. It's New York's secret island. This grainy footage is one of the few times that what occurs here has been recorded. This mass burial site is where the bodies of the city's destitute and unknown, both adults and babies, end up. The babies or fetuses are all buried in one particular part of Potter's Field. The posts over here signify which hospital the infant comes from. There are two or three burial days a week here. The coffins are buried three deep in trenches. The burial detail made up of Rikers Island inmates. Today, no cameras, cell phones or media are allowed onto this forbidden ground. And nor are the people whose loved ones are buried here. But today, Laurie Grant is a woman on a mission. You get a, a sense from that video of what is going on. And I have to tell you, after uh, John contacted me, uh, I was like, I guess like everybody else, well, that's interesting. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. buried there. But when you see it and you see, uh, you know, inmates from Rikers loading these, these coffins, it's, it's somewhat macabre, but somewhat incredible. Um, about how many are still... Uh, buried on that island every day, every week, every month. Can you uh, characterize that for me? Well, the numbers are down now because the medical examiner is doing a much better job of identifying people since 9-11. We have excellent forensics in New York City. So most people are identified buried on Hard Island. They're not just John Doe's. 
and um, the medical examiner uh, will hold a body for up to a week, but sometimes that's not long enough if the family is out of state and hasn't gotten their uh, estate organized. And, and how many uh, did you say per week, per month? Well, there's about 1,500 per year. Per about, year? So yeah, about a third of them are babies. Wow. And, and the rest are, are uh, unclaimed people. Unclaimed just means that the family didn't make arrangements with a private funeral director. Or maybe there wasn't a family to be contacted or it didn't appear yeah. there was one. Also, also uh, when people donate their bodies to medicine, very often the family doesn't ask for the body back and those bodies are also buried wow. on Hard Island. So it's not just people whom nobody cared about, it's often individuals who are generous enough to leave their body to medicine. Did you find, uh, when you first got involved, that all you had to do was simply, you know, play a phone call or use a lawyer or whatever, and the records existed for these people, or did you have to uh, do some digging and really develop your own database, or was it, you know, somewhere in a basement in, in Lower Manhattan was where they had the information? No, actually all of the records were kept on Hart Island. On the island? On the island. In little index cards, I'm guessing. Uh, no, in ledger <laughs> books in a trailer six wow. feet, feet above sea level. So I had seen them uh, recording the records when we were working on our book. And I became very concerned that those records were quite vulnerable to fire or to flooding. Being ca the only copies were on Hart Island, and Hart Island isn't occupied most of the time, so it was very vulnerable to vandalism or to a hurricane, that kind of thing. So I worked with lawyers to request 50,000 burial records, and the thought was, well, the city will have to duplicate those records in order to provide me with copies. So if I have a set of copies and they have a set of copies, then if fire or flood goes through, it's not going to erase all those graves. And that's just since 1980. Many of the records were lost in a fire from 1961 through 1977. Wow. They, the vandals broke on, into Hard Island, set fire to the records room, and whole decades were lost. And many of those families are still looking for relatives and do contact me every week, but we don't have those records. John, uh, you yeah. kind of snickered a little bit when you heard, when, when yeah. you heard her talk about the fact that they, the records were kept in books and it was above sea level, yeah. presumably, so it wouldn't get flooded or whatever. Uh, yeah. well, what's your what's your reaction to that? I mean, to yeah. me, it sounds like there's an important personal history, if nothing else, of the city that yeah. is being treated as such. I, you're absolutely right. And I mean, you showed a little bit of the video earlier, and they showed the entryway to Hart Island, which sits on Fordham Street and actually Fordham Road uh, on the intersection there. That looks like the entryway of the Berlin Wall. I mean, that's kind of, symb uh, kind of symbolic, if you will, of kind of the procedures that Melinda's had to go through. I mean, lawsuits are really what drove us up to this point, introducing of legislation to really start that dialogue. And that's really what we've been involved in. Uh, we wrote a letter uh, back in October uh, asking for a tour, and we were provided one actually pretty quickly. I know Melinda came on the tour along with the Civic and the City Island Chamber of Commerce. <clears throat> and what we saw on the tour, uh, we were given a very extensive tour, but it kind of reminded me in a sense that if I was just a... A, a relative of a, of a person who had passed who was buried there, I would have been treated uh, as well as I think we were because we had sent it through all the proper channels. We knew what to do. And that's really what a lot of these families seem to be facing is that, you know, they're signing this paperwork, uh, you know, kind of under duress, and then they're being denied access to their loved one. How much of this or your interest in this is because of the historical nature, not of necessarily no. of the people and the personal issues with the people who might be buried, but the historical nature of, of the island, the fact that this yeah. is an island right outside City Island yeah. that, that nobody's really ever been on. I yeah. mean, is there hope for it to be, I mean, it'll be a cemetery for it to yeah. be more than just that, or is that what it's going to be? Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, if we get it classified over as a park, we can try to apply for different grants to kind of restore some of the stuff that's already there. The island has very unique history. Uh, when we were there, we visited a Confederate War Memorial it was used as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an internment camp for Confederate prisoners. Additionally, it was used as a Nike missile base during the Cold War. So pretty much during different segments of American history, Hart Island has served the country in one form or another. And uh, you know, that's a very interesting sto uh, story we could look to maybe try to tell. What condition, uh, Ms. Hunt, what condition are uh, the graves in uh, as a cemetery? I mean, uh, ha has it been 
properly done, respectfully done, or uh, is it is it somewhat chaotic and you know unfortunate? Well, in um 1872, when they set up the system of mass burials. The burials began in 1869. About 140 but in, years. In 1872, yeah. it was a modern cemetery. Uh, it was 16 miles from New York because the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens were not part of New York then. Hart Island was purchased by the city for the purpose of setting up a boys' workhouse for the House of Refuge, uh, older boys from the House of Refuge on Randall's Island. And what happened was Thomas Brennan went to Paris and visited the morgue in Paris and decided he was going to set up an uh, um, uh, examining room, a morgue, at Bellevue Hospital so that the dead could be identified correctly. And that is he, unbelievable. And he, <laughs> he decided that this random way that they were burying people in the potter's fields and you know before that Ward's Island was a potter's field, Randall's Island was a potter's field, the location of the New York Public Library was a potter's field, Washington Square, Madison Square, City Hall Park, those all have burials, okay, the, and they're nice parts. Yeah, by the way, now. we have photos. If you want to roll some of these photos so you can get a better picture of some of the things Melinda's talking about, let's do yeah, it. So, so anyways, Thomas Brennan decided that they needed to have a more orderly system of burials. So they were resorted to the ledger books, which were developed during the Civil War for identifying Civil War soldiers and returning them to their families. And this uh, grid system of mass graves was what he came up with as a system for being able to call back bodies to the medical examiner. So essentially, that's the 19th century system that we are still, still using, using today. Still using, oh my goodness right. gracious. Yeah. And, but we have a very 21st century medical examiner, right? Using DNA forensic like and whatnot. Sure. But we're so, still so. using prison inmates left over like the boys from the House of Refuge. Still using prison inmates to bury people 150 at a time. And it's quite arduous to get those bodies sure. back. Do, so, by the way, do we have those photos? Can we, yeah. Oh, first of all, here's the, the map which shows how, mm. uh, how close it is. I mean, City Island is there on the left, and it is literally almost the size of City Island. I mean, mm. not quite as large, but it's not like a, just a little, you know, tiny piece of land. Mm -hmm. So let me, you know, the story, the plot thickens a little bit. So in, um, in 2008, 2009, we were putting together a database uh, from this 50,000 burial records that we got through Freedom of Information. And there was a duplicate grave for a thousand infants. Right. And uh, so I thought about it for a little while and I asked a few lawyers and they said, well, you should file a criminal complaint with the Attorney General's office if you think there were a thousand mishandled infants burials. Did you believe that to be true? Oh yeah, and it is true. Um, so I did file a criminal complaint. And I got With the this current um, Attorney General? No, it was uh, uh, Elliot Spitzer. Okay. Or was it? It was Cuomo, Cuomo back in Cuomo. the way. Andrew Cuomo back at that time. Okay. Uh, 2009. And what was He's got response? it all straight. At any rate. Uh, well, it you was, make a good team. It was, it, was, it was one of those guys who went on to be governor. <laughs> and, uh, oh, two very at, different tales. At any rate, um, it opened an investigation, and the city was ordered to remap Hart Island and to collect GPS data of the various mass graves. So now, as of last year, we were able to get that GPS data through Freedom of Information and put that on a map. And there are still, there are still five infant graves that are missing and five adult graves that are missing. So that's another 5,750 bodies wow. from the 80s that the city doesn't know where they are. On, and presumably on the island. Right. Then, there's, so, there, yeah. then anything earlier this than 19... Yeah. Anything earlier than 1980 um, largely isn't on the map. There are no babies earlier than 1981 that are accounted for. With the records that the Department of Correction has go back to 1977, but those graves are hard to locate. So basically the whole system needs to be rethought. Is and that part of uh, the legislation that you're looking for? Well, I'm hoping that the city council, when they transfer it to parks and it becomes open, I'm hope, hoping that they will rethink the burial process. And just look at the whole Yeah, because thing. I think at this point that they should build structured burial vaults. And there's when, a when you come in contact with people who are looking for their loved ones, um, are you able ultimately, with the work that you've already done, 
to put two and two together, let them see where, and, and then actually bring them to the island and see where their loved ones might be buried? Well, or is that not happening at this point? I mean, there were some incidents in that, uh, that video, that Australian video, they showed one or two people. Mm -hmm. My sense, based on what you said, is that there would be a lot more people who would be interested in stuff like that. I get contacted every day. Every day? Yeah. And are you able to help them? Yeah, because now we created an online map that on our website. Which we're going to show. You know what? Yeah. Let's pull that up right now and show Great some of that, website. some of where some of those records are, which are right on the website, which is heartislandproject.net. Right? Heart That's Island, just heartisland.net. Heart Island, I'm sorry, heartisland.net. So we'll, we'll put some of those uh, so up on the So anybody can go in and they can type in a last name or they can go to the interactive map and they can select that plot number and that'll open up yeah, there deconstruct you can, the entire you can grave. See that, that's what the, the website Those are all random here. people uh, in the database, and uh, the public is invited to add a story or reclaim that in person. In other words, so if you may know somebody, you can actually enter something about them, and it becomes for the first time mm -hmm. a, a record of who these people are. Well, and you can stop their clock of anonymity. There's a little bit of a gaming feature. Yes, uh, so that show, I saw it that. shows the amount of time that someone has been buried in anonymity until somebody. Uh, pulls them out of anonymity by adding a story. Yeah, I'd like to show, We I know we have one of the records, I'd like to show one of the, the actual records of somebody which we can put up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, John, where are, we, where are we at as far as this legislation? Sure. Uh, do you feel like we're getting to a point where, because, uh, yeah. uh, you know, with, with even things that involve living people, yeah. it becomes very difficult to move the city to transfer properties, transfer land, mm -hmm. and undertake a project like this. Well, you're absolutely right. I feel that this last year we've made tremendous progress. The bill was reintroduced. It had been introduced in the last council. Uh, we had the same sponsors on as last time. We had Crowley, Councilman Vaca. Uh, we also had Annabelle Palmer and we had uh, Andy Cohen on one of the bills already. Uh, we worked together and we were able to get uh, Councilman Torres, Councilman King, Councilman Cabrera, Councilman Ar Councilwoman Arroyo, rather. These are all Bronx people. All the Bronx. We're trying to get the entire Bronx delegation. We have one member still outstanding, but okay. I spoke to her office and they indicated she has a couple of process questions and she is leaning on supporting the legislation. So we, we're hopeful we'll have the whole delegation by year's end. By and year's end. So yes. that's the, yeah. well, I mean, we're, we're recording this just a little bit beforehand, yeah. but the year's They'll end. will be able to fact be, check me now. We're in a couple of days. <laughs> what were you going to say? And uh, the speaker, yes, which the is speaker, what's absolutely. why we didn't have the speaker yeah. uh, with the do previous. Do you have a dollar edition. amount of what it might cost taxpayers to say, well, okay, we want to do this? Well, you know, Although, you know, you can go from zero to a million in, in yeah. a minute and decide, exactly. well, we need this, this, it's, and this. It's costing taxpayers quite a lot because people sue the city for wrongful burial. And those are million, and those are million dollar payouts, yeah, wow. almost automatically. So yeah. the idea that prison labor is cheap really isn't true. So, um, you know, there hasn't really been a cost analysis, but the Department of Correction currently spends a half million do dollars out of their $1 billion budget. So it's a very small part of what the Department of Correction does. And uh, we feel that, you know, it basically you don't need prison inmates doing this. If you had structured burial vaults, the Department of Health could do the whole thing. Could simply take them and... Yeah, and then the, and then the medical examiner wouldn't have any trouble going back and retrieving remains and when a family shows up and whatnot, they don't have to go through this whole uh, dark process of getting the body back. The city can just hand it over. Well, what, what do people say? Do, are there, are, is there a relief and, and uh, you know, the, the kind of, uh, I guess, the expression of emotion that you would see at any grave, even though you can't pinpoint an individual plot, I'm assuming? I think there's, there's a kind of connection that takes place that is a very fundamental form of human storytelling. To visit a grave site is essentially how human beings began to keep their history, right? To remember who came before you, it's normal to go to that grave site and talk about that there person. There is closure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and well, that's just part closure. of who we are as people. Um, uh, do people get on the island to do that? I mean, are you yeah, able I to took two women last year who were so, very but grateful. Two women last year and compared to the sixty-two thousand. this 000, year, sorry. This year, but compared to the sixty-two well, thousand that are buried, that doesn't sound like a lot of people. There's a New York Civil Liberty uh, Union class action lawsuit that's been filed, a federal suit wow. that um, is challenging the city, um, the city's policy 
of using the prison system to keep people from visiting. Sounds games. like there's a lot of ways you can get in on trying to make changes. Uh, John, what do we advise people to do? Is there somebody they can call or just yeah, be interested? Yeah, I mean, or? look up your local city council person, make sure that they understand that you support uh, the transfer of jurisdiction over from the Corrections Department to the Parks Department. At the same time, you can always contact the council speaker's office right. and, and let them know you want. Heart Island .net Heart is Island the way and they can, they can advise uh, the council speaker that they'd like to see a hearing and a vote on this matter. Well, tremendous. Um, Ms. Hunt, anything else that you want to add that we didn't ask you about or uh, an agenda? You've got to be quick. I think there are some people who think that it's inappropriate for a cemetery to become a park, but when you see how successful Washington Square is as a park and Madison Square and the Public so Library the, uh, and Bryant the, Park. The Van Cortlands are buried at the top of uh, Vault right. Hill up there exactly. in Van Cortland That's Park. So. so we are as New Yorkers. I guess so. Uh, Melinda Hunt, president of the Heart Island Project, thank you. And John Doyle, thank, thank you for much. bringing it to our attention. Absolutely. The secretary, the corresponding secretary of the City Island Civic Association, we appreciate your time. If you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, then email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You put them on our Facebook page. We'll read them on the air during a future edition of, of our program. Or send it to the people like these folks who might need to uh, take a look and respond. You can like, which I hope you will, Bronx Talk on our Facebook page. Page. You can check our archives at bronxnet.org. You can see all the old shows if you find Bronx Talk on the lower right navigation bar. Next week, first show of 2015, Council Member Richie Torres will join us. Then the week after, on January 12th, it's the Women of Woodlawn. Oh. Uh, they're, they're all laughing over here. Uh, <laughs> Bronx Talk, Monday nights at 9 on Channel 67 and Fios 33. Thanks to Dahlia, to Bianca. And to you, guess what? Happy New Year. See you next year. Good night. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community.